Jesus, who is Jewish. And what do the Jewish people have when it comes to understanding the good news? They have the false understanding. They have been taught by false teachers that their way into the kingdom is to do what? To follow the laws of God and they can work their way into the kingdom. But church, that's not good news because God deserves perfection. For God, the law must be fulfilled perfectly. And man, in our fallen state, we can't. So for someone to say to the Jewish people that you can work your way into heaven, that's not good news. That is bad news. But underneath these false teachers, that is what they have been taught. A works-based salvation that is a false gospel. Because the word doesn't teach that. And yet here Jesus is preaching the truth. And the thousands of Jewish people are hearing this truth. And what is that truth, church? It's the greatest news that any man can ever hear. That God sent his only begotten son to fulfill the law perfectly. And for all those who place their faith in him, their sins will be and have been imputed to him that day on the cross. But it is a double imputation. Because he, for those who place their faith in him, their sins were placed on Christ. But his righteousness was given to those who have faith in him. It is a transaction that man does not deserve. And yet that was the plan before the foundation of the world. For the perfect only begotten son to take away the sins of those whose faith has been and will be placed in him. So again, Jesus inside the temple preaching this. He's correcting the false teachers. And guess what? The religious leaders hear it. And they don't like it. So the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, they've been planning this. They've been planning to trap Jesus, and this was their moment. So here they are. They come up to Jesus in front of the thousands, and they ask him, tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. Now they, they thought they had him, right? This was their gotcha moment. They knew that Jesus never studied underneath a rabbi. And if he answered that his authority came from God, as he had done before, they could arrest him for blasphemy. Why? Because he's also made the claim that he is the Messiah. So if he's claiming to be the Messiah and that his authority came from God, charge could be blasphemy. Now it would be a false charge, of course, because that's who truly Jesus is, the Messiah. But they could charge him with blasphemy, arrest him on those charges. Now this is what's beautiful because Jesus, being God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, knew exactly what they were doing. So he flips it around on them. He's not going to answer that question, but he is going to ask one. He says, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Now, the Jewish people loved John the Baptist. They believed that he was a prophet from God. 
So the religious leaders, they couldn't say, well, he's just a man. They would have had a riot on their hands. Because of the Jewish people, they understood who John the Baptist was, a true prophet. And what did John the Baptist say about Jesus? When John the Baptist was still alive, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when he said that, who was he pointing to? Jesus. And there was a massive crowd around John the Baptist then. So again, the religious leaders were just kind of staring at each other, whispering, how do we answer this? I don't know. We're not in a good position. So they said, they had no idea where John came from. And then Jesus looked at them and said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And this is earth-shattering church, because what does this mean? Here Jesus is saying that no more evidence will be given to those who have rejected me. You have all the evidence you need, and yet you still do not believe who I am. You have God's words, meaning the prophets and the law, and they all point to Jesus and here he is fulfilling every prophetic word and upholding the law perfectly and the religious leaders reject him God's patience was gone for they rejected the truth time and time again and now that truth has been taken away all right let's dig in to Luke 20 Verse 9, now this very well could be happening right after all this took place. And it says here in verse 9, And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and led it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. Now we know, we know by this point in Luke that Jesus is a brilliant storyteller. And he's a brilliant storyteller because his stories would use imagery that the Israelites understood and saw on a daily basis. So in this parable, Jesus speaks of a man who planted a vineyard that, of course, would provide fruit. Now, this parable is also told in Matthew. And in the parable in Matthew, we learn that this man put a wall around his vineyard, put a wine press in it, and also built a watchtower to protect the vineyard against animals and thieves. Now Jesus tells the listeners that this man who built the vineyard went into another country, and he was renting out this vineyard while he was gone. And and this was a common occurrence during that time. This happened all the time. So these farmers, the tenants, used the vineyard, And would pay the man who owned the vineyard a percentage of their harvest. So the man being away in another country, look at verse 10. It says, when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. Again, this was common. For the owner would send a servant in his place to gather the percentage of fruit. But it's what happens next that shocked the listeners. Again, Jesus is a brilliant storyteller, and and his stories are often very graphic and violent. Why? Because it grabs your attention. You can't shake that imagery from your mind. Look at what he says. But the tenants beat him. And sent him away empty-handed. Now the Greek term beat is more graphic than our English understanding. It is much stronger. Because in the Greek it means to literally remove skin. That's the kind of beating this servant received. It was horrendous 
Now, we're not certain how the flesh would have been removed. I mean, did they use a similar instrument that they used when it came to flogging someone? Have different elements at the end of each of the whips, such as metal and bone, that every time it would hit the skin, it would tear flesh from it? We don't know. Or did they actually hold him down and just start carving? Either way, it was a violent act. And this would have angered the listeners. For this to be such a common practice, but for them to hear this servant being treated in this manner on behalf of his master, it would have angered them and shocked them. But the man, the owner of the vineyard, what does he do? Pay close attention. He gives them another chance. Look at verse 11. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. Same result as before. And what does he do? He gives them another chance. Now, at this point in the parable, you probably don't want to be the next tenant I mean, the next servant that's going to be sent. You've already seen what's happened twice. It's like when you get asked a question in class and you don't know the answer, you automatically look at your desk. Don't call on me, don't call on me, don't call on me. But here, a third person is sent. Verse 12, and he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. beaten, and sent out without payment. Now verse 13 says, Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? Now the crowd was expecting that the owner would respond in anger. That he would send men to go after the tenants who were using his land. Because they had violated the agreement. So send an army of men to collect. Vengeance was what they were craving. And that's what the crowd was expecting to hear. But instead, Jesus shocks them yet again. He says, I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. I mean, they've already beaten three of his servants, flayed one of them. All three came back with absolutely nothing. But here he's sending his son. Now, we are starting to see the picture in this parable, right? I mean, it, it's, it's unfolding before our eyes here. But instead of respect... The tenants saw this as their chance to take control of the vineyard once and for all. So the son is sent, and look at verse 14. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. Now, now we hear this today, and it doesn't really make much sense to us, does it? I mean, you, you kill the son, get the inheritance. Uh, wait, what's going on here? What they thought inside this parable, the tenants, may have been this. The son wasn't coming to collect a percentage. He was coming to collect his inheritance. This was going to be his land. If the tenants weren't going to pay their percentage, the son was taking over. Now, during that time period, after three years, the owner doesn't come back and claim the land. The tenants working it can claim it. So their thought is this. Here comes the son. We'll kill him. And after three years, this will be our land. 
That's exactly what they did. Verse 15 says, and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. The listeners would have just been shaking their head at this point. The, the story just took a Hitchcock spin. They didn't expect for the son to be killed. He beat the tenants. They beat the tenants, but here they kill the son. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Now, before we go any further, let's break this parable down. We all know that God is the owner of the vineyard. He planted it, the vineyard being the household of Israel. The tenants, that being the vine growers, were the false prophets and the wicked religious leaders. So this parable is actually a history of Israel. And the history of Israel keeps repeating itself. The people of God would be led by false teachers, prophets, and priests. And these false teachers, prophets, and priests would do what, church? They would twist the word, producing rotten fruit. So God, throughout history, would send his prophets to preach the good news, the truth that would produce nourishing fruit that the Israelites needed to hear. They were the servants. But the tenants, again, who are the false teachers, despised the servants who are God's prophets. And what would they do to them? They would persecute them and or kill them. Here's just a few examples. According to tradition, the prophet Isaiah was killed by being sawn in half. Jeremiah was persecuted over and over, and tradition tells us he was eventually stoned to death by the Jews. Ezekiel was despised, constantly threatened. Amos had to run for his life. Again, those are just some of the examples. Now, of course, Jesus telling this parable that God, owner of the vineyard, will send his son. And of course, that's Jesus. So the people, the Jews, listening to this parable, they're, they're starting to put the pieces together. They're, they're figuring out that Jesus is speaking of himself. And they're looking at each other. And they're probably asking, is Jesus saying that he's going to be killed by the religious leaders? Is that where this parable is going? But it's interesting. Because even in the parable, notice the servants were not killed or beaten in the vineyard. It was outside. So Jesus is even saying that he will be killed by the religious leaders, but not in Jerusalem. Now they will soon find out, and we know that he will be killed in Golgotha. We also know the religious leaders hated Jesus they hated him because he exposed them as being false teachers. See, these false teachers, they loved being idolized and being fawned all over. They loved to be seen as authoritative and powerful. But with Jesus around and his absolute perfect righteousness on display, it illuminated their self-righteousness and their wickedness. So it's here in this parable that we see the history of God's people from the Old Testament to the New. And the old God was with his people, 
by giving them his laws and his prophets. They rejected his laws, persecuted and killed his prophets. Then, between the Old and the New Testament, there was a period of silence. Then comes the last Old Testament prophet, everyone's favorite prophet, or it should be, John the Baptist. And what happens to John? He points to Jesus as the one, tells them to repent and to believe. And then he calls out a political leader, King Herod, for his sin of adultery and is killed. So it's here that Jesus is sent, and it's here where the religious leaders will kill him. So what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Man, this question. Again, here they are putting the pieces together. They're understanding that the, the leaders, by way of this parable, are, are going to kill Jesus. They know by way of this parable that Jesus is speaking of himself as being the son, being sent. The Messiah that's been promised. And this question, they're being asked to really think about the consequences of their actions. What will God do to those who kill his son? Verse 16 says, He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Church, what's the New Testament about? It's about how the nation of Israel, God's own people, have rejected him. So God will destroy them and take the good news to the Gentiles, to the world. So the Jewish people hearing this, this parable are saying, to one another, he's, he's talking about us. And when they heard this, they said, surely not. God is going to destroy us and take the good news to the world? Th that can't be. Because we're God's people. Salvation is only for us. That's what they believed. But they had rejected the truth. Now we know that God isn't going to annihilate all the Jewish people. There would be some who would come to believe. But church, we know that in four decades from this time, God's wrath was going to fall upon them, destroying everything they knew. And this was a hard truth for them to hear by way of this parable. But notice something, church, and this is extremely important. Jesus didn't care about their feelings. He wanted them to hear the truth. I'm afraid this is why. The church struggles today. Because the elders, the person behind the pulpit, is more concerned about giving you the warm and fuzzies. Is more concerned about telling you how great you are. Instead of saying what? No, you are a sinner in need of the Savior. You wretch. Well, that's not very nice. Who cares? 
I'm going to have to stand before God one day. Do you think he's going to ask me, quit, can you tell me why you didn't make those people feel good about themselves? Why were you not more like Joel? Huh? He made people feel good all the time. See, I'm more concerned about you guys hearing the truth than I am to bring up your self-esteem. We can't sissify our words any longer because that hinders the truth and that hinders the church. There's only one truth and it's the word and we can't soften it. We can't make it easy so you guys can walk out of here feeling great about yourselves. Sometimes the truth of God is like a baseball bat to the cranium. And there are times when we as believers need to swing as hard as we can. Look at verse 17. Jesus looks directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? You can just picture Jesus looking at this massive crowd of people, the religious leaders standing there. But Jesus is staring a hole through them. You ever got that look from your dad when you knew you did something wrong, and he found out that you did something wrong. And there's that moment where he's just looking at you, and you want to be anywhere but there. I just pictured Jesus doing that. Staring right through them. And he quotes Psalm 118.22 and Daniel 2.34, and they knew these passages. He goes on to say, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's here that the audience is seeing the comparison from Jesus' parable to the word of God. The son in Jesus' parable is the stone that the builders have rejected. Jesus is the stone that the Jewish people have rejected. And they knew that the cornerstone is the most significant stone in the building structure. It sets every angle for the building. And they understood that without a perfect cornerstone, the building would not be plumb. In Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected represented Israel. And this very stone that the Israelites rejected will be the cornerstone of God's nation. So Jesus, the son in the parable, who was killed, is the redeemer and the cornerstone church. The builders who rejected him are the religious leaders of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. So Jesus becomes the cornerstone of the new building, the New Testament church that will be made up of Gentile believers and the Jewish people who leave Judaism and follow Christ. And then verse 18 Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. Does that give you the warm and fuzzies, church? Oh, good. Everybody that rejects Jesus? Eh, eternal damnation. 
Why do I need to tell people about Jesus? This is why. Now, of course, this is also speaking prophetically of 40 years down the road when the Roman Empire, that being God's wrath, will destroy Jerusalem once and for all. But church, it's also speaking of those who reject the Savior, the magnificent Redeemer. This should terrify us. This should make us run out and tell our family and friends, our enemies who are non-believers, you should want and go and just tell them the good news. Because this will be their outcome. They will be broken to pieces. And they will be crushed by God's wrath. So you can take your warm and fuzzy feelings and smoke it. Let us pray.